Honorable Member for Castro itself. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this bill is one of the worst examples of a bill that we have come to this House to consider. We have said a lot, Mr. Speaker, in this House about accountability, transparency. And Mr. Speaker, this bill in many ways presents a severe departure from the high standards of, of accountability and transparency that we expect in the functioning of government. And Mr. Speaker, my advice to the leader of the opposition is that when the St. Lucia Labour Party becomes the next government, we must repeal this immediately, Mr. Speaker. Immediately, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I will go through this bill, and I will ask some questions, Mr. Speaker, that I hope can allay my, my fears that this bill should never have come before this House, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, when you asked for the suspension of the standing orders, I said no, Mr. Speaker, because I believe, Mr. Speaker, there are bills that would, we would accept. You need to suspend the standing orders and for them to go through all the stages. But there are some bills that are so important, Mr. Speaker. We should not allow, Mr. Speaker, for those bills to go through all its stages in one sitting. We should allow the citizens of this country to reflect on the provisions of those bills and for us to be able to get some feedback from the wider public as to the construction of some of those and intent of some of those bills. We would have received those bills a few days ago, not many days ago, Mr. Speaker. The public would not have seen that bill before, Mr. Speaker. And today is going to go through all its stages, Mr. Speaker. And it's a very serious bill, Mr. Speaker. A very serious bill, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister made a very bizarre statement. He said that the Attorney General told him, based on the provision in the CIP Act, that you cannot open an account. I cannot imagine the Attorney General offering such legal advice to the Minister of Finance that the Act provides for the establishment of the National Economic Fund. It says where the money will come from. And it says, importantly, and that's a fundamental principle that has been betrayed in this bill, that the minister has to come to parliament to explain to the people of St. Lucia how much CIP monies are expected to be received, how those monies would be spent, and for parliament to approve it. This bill takes that away, but we'll come to that again later, Mr. Speaker. But for the Attorney General to advise the Prime Minister that based on the CIP Act, that the Minister of Finance cannot open an account is bizarre, Mr. Speaker. Accounts can be opened by the Accountant General, Mr. Speaker. How does the Act, the CIP Act, prevent the opening of an account Mr. Speaker, I need the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance to explain that to me. I've never heard such an absurdity before, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister also said that in the Act, the CIP Act, it required us to come to Parliament indicating what the estimates would be, how it would be spent, and that was not adequate. But this also provides for it to be done, not to Parliament, not to Parliament, but to the Minister. So listen to that. It was inadequate to come to Parliament to say how much money would be received and how it would be spent and get approval. But it is adequate for the Minister to receive it. The Prime Minister spoke about an escrow account. And Mr. Speaker, let me take the opportunity to tell you. The statutory instrument that was tabled before this parliament this morning changes to the CIP regulations, Mr. Speaker. You can expect a negative resolution from us, Mr. Speaker. We can, you can expect a negative resolution from us on these changes, Mr. Speaker. We must ask to negate some of those changes, maybe not all, because there's a fundamental change that was made this morning in the SI which was tabled. Of course, you don't debate them. Where 
it is, the law has been changed or the, the regulations have been changed to allow for an escrow account to be held outside St. Lucia. Before that was not allowed under the CIP regulations, Mr. Speaker. And now it's going to be allowed for our CIP money to be held outside St. Lucia. But we'll come to that in the next sitting of the House, Mr. Speaker. There's also an elephant in this room that we're all talking about, Mr. Speaker. At the seat, last sitting of Parliament, debating in the Prime Minister's rebuttal, sought to respond to the questions that have been asked over and over. Where has the CIP money gone? What has happened to the millions of dollars collected from the CIP? And he stood up and he started to cite projects that were funded from the CIP. And Mr. Speaker, I objected. And I said to the Honorable House that there is no way in the estimates that indicated any project was funded under the CIP. The Prime Minister stated then that it is there. The House continued its business. I objected again. And I asked for a copy of the document the Prime Minister was quoting from. He promised copies would be made to honorable members. To this date, no one on our side has received any document as promised by the, the, the Prime Minister at that last sitting of the House, Mr. Speaker. And I'm still waiting for the House to provide us with copies of that document, Mr. Speaker. We need to know what has happened to the millions of dollars collected by, through the CIP. We need to know, Mr. Speaker. We need to know every cent that was collected and how every single cent was dispensed, Mr. Speaker. Where the CIP money gone, Mr. Speaker? And there's a reason why the Prime Minister is not making it public, but we're going to wait for it to be made public, Mr. Speaker. We have to make, it has to be made public, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Section 33 of the CIP Act, and I need to repeat it, says that the minister must come to Parliament indicating how the monies for last year were spent. He has to indicate how much money is expected to be received for the coming year and how the monies are to be spent, and Parliament has to approve it. And the minister has to tell the Honorable House and the people of St. Lucia why has parliamentary oversight and parliamentary approval of CIP monies been removed, Mr. Speaker? That section has been repealed, and it is not reproduced in this bill. The parliament is the chamber, is the elected members, Mr. Speaker, to provide parliamentary oversight and to provide approval, Mr. Speaker, and it has been removed. How can that be an advancement on accountability and transparency, Mr. Speaker? It has been removed. This is a backward step. We are removing from the laws of St. Lucia the provision that Parliament must receive an account, Mr. Speaker, on our CIP monies and how it has been spent. Why is that being done, Mr. Speaker? I will admit, Mr. Speaker, that it provides for a report to be tabled in Parliament, to be laid. But when it's laid, there is no debate on it. When it, is when it comes to the House, there is no discussion on it. There is no approval given. How can you tell me there is greater accountability and transparency when you are moving a fundamental principle, which is to provide parliamentary oversight and parliamentary approval of the CIP monies, Mr. Speaker? You would recall the Prime Minister said that when he came into office, there were no regulations for the National Economic Fund, and he could not come to Parliament. Hey, how absurd it is. He could not come to Parliament to say how he has been spending the money because there were no regulations. Mr. Speaker, reflect on this. The law says you must come to the House to say how much money that you, you got and how you spent it. And you're saying you cannot do that. Sorry? How you intend and how you spent last year's money. And to ask the approval of the House. And you couldn't do that because there were no regulations. But this bill doesn't provide for any regulations. It doesn't provide for any regulations. But let's put that aside, Mr. Speaker. So there were no regulations. And you know what the Prime Minister said? He was going to establish a sovereign fund. 
All the monies from CIP would go to a sovereign fund. And considerable amounts of monies were spent by the government hiring consultants and international experts to present a concept for a sovereign fund. I saw a couple of drafts, mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker. Up to today, we've not been told how much money was paid by the government to those consultants and international experts that were advising on how to set up a sovereign fund. Where has the sovereign fund gone? Now, you'd recall, I said in this house, I supported the establishment of a sovereign fund. I said so. But all of a sudden, there is no more sovereign fund, Mr. Speaker. There is now a national economic fund, but not the national economic fund that was in the act a different national economic fund. So, Mr. Speaker, let us take a look at the provisions of the bill, Mr. Speaker. Let's take a look at it. It starts off with the functions of the fund, and the Prime Minister mentioned them. To advance loans for government-approved capital project, to provide investment for government-approved capital project. What is a government-approved capital project? So. Mr. Speaker, 4.2 says, what is a government-approved capital project? Look at the bill. You, you'll answer what I'm saying. Under the, the, the bill, Mr. Speaker, it defines what's a government-approved capital project. And that's where I have a problem. Listen to what it says. For the purposes of subsection 1A and 1B, the minister shall, after consultation, if cabinet by order, publish in the Gazette, Declare a government approved capital project. But what is a government approved capital project? But what's that? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, he's a real simple son, you know. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, is a government, government approved capital project? And let me help him understand. Is it a capital project? executed by government, so you look at the estimates and there are a list of capital projects? Or is it any project in this country that government approves and deems a capital project for the purposes of uh, sourcing money from the fund? Now, that's important, Mr. Speaker, because later on I'll point out to you that there, there is a difference. So when you look at government capital projects, we build health centers, we build roads, we build bridges. We build schools. We build playing fields. These are the traditional government capital projects. Is that what has been referred to there? Is that what's been referred to there? Or is it an investor wanting to build a new restaurant and it is deemed necessary for the development of the country, so the government deems it an approved pro capital project? Now. Now, that sounds absurd, but later on you'll understand why I'm saying that. So, government might decide setting up a factory or call center is an approved capital project, and therefore it should be financed under this fund. What is a government approved capital project? Is it government capital projects, or is it any project that is of a capital nature that the government approves as necessary for our national development? And that's important. It doesn't say that, Mr. Speaker. It does not define what that is. But it goes on, Mr. Speaker, to reduce government debt. I don't know that any of us can argue about using money to reduce government debt. To purchase government bonds. Now, Mr. Speaker, I have been told, and those of us on this side, we don't understand how to make money work. So maybe, in fact, we don't for true, Mr. Speaker. But somebody explained to me, and sometimes it flies over my head, because the, because the experts and the amateurs are on this side, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, explain it to me. Why would, why would you be buying government bonds from the National Economic Fund? Now, we buy bonds, you, 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 government raises bonds because we want to repair a school, build a bridge, build a road. So if you have $40 million available in the fund, why don't you just use it to build a school or build a road? Why would you buy bonds that are required to, that will be used to do it. Explain to me, because that's government's money. That's our CIP revenue, revenue earned from the, from the, the, the transaction of our citizenship. So why in the fund, you will use money in the fund, which is government money, to buy government bonds? 
Why would government buy its own bonds? Maybe I'm missing something. I'm not a banker, Mr. Speaker, and there are bankers on the government side, so maybe he advised them, Mr. Speaker. Or maybe the, the person on this side, who, um, the, the Pajua expert, can tell us why government will use its own money to buy. Maybe Pajua can advise us, Mr. Speaker. That's a good company that can explain that one. You understand, Mr. Speaker? Companies like Pajua probably wrote this bill, Mr. Speaker. Why would you? Somebody explain that one to me. Or maybe the member from Ancillary Canaries can explain it. To provide monies for a purpose approved by cabinet that is not considered recurrent in nature. For, for projects, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, explain that one to me. Again, it misses me. Money from the CIP comes into the government and government is you know, lending that same money from its own self, its own revenue, because it's government's revenue. It is government's revenue. So I, maybe I don't understand it for you. I don't know how money works. You do one, Mr. Honorable Member. Well, but it, but it, to provide to provide means to lend the money. So you can grant them. Honorable then there should be a section saying loan, investment, and grants. Mr. Speaker, let's go on, Mr. Speaker. Hear this one, Mr. Speaker. The St. Lucia National Economic Fund Board. The governing body of the St. Lucia National Economic Fund is the St. Lucia National Economic Fund Board. The board consists of no less than five members and no more than seven members to be appointed by cabinet as follows. And they list seven specific persons who will be on the board. Now, I'm not a legal draftsman either. I'm not a lawyer. But somebody explain to me. When is it five, and when is it six, and when is it seven? Now, it would have been different if the drafters had put in there no less than five, but no more than seven, drawn from the following skills or expertise, finance, accounting, law, and then they give seven categories of skills and expertise, and you say no, more than, no less than five, but no more than seven. But you give the range of expertise that board members must have. But you name seven positions. So if it is five, which two do you leave out? You choose which two? So you just put seven in a bag and you just choose. Mr. Speaker, this is serious business. Now maybe the Prime Minister can explain that to us. When is it five and when is it seven? Because seven specific positions are mentioned as members of the board. And like I said, if you had named seven skills or expertise area and you said no less than five, no more than seven, I can, I, I can see the sensibility in that, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it says, it says, Mr. Speaker, the board shall manage the monies and business of the fund. It shall consider and approve an application for a loan or investment in a government approved project. And it goes on, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, is the board an executing agency? Is it a decision-making agency? I'm asking, Mr. Speaker, because we're talking about tens of millions of dollars, probably hundreds of millions of dollars. Is there any unit? Is there any staff? Are the board members themselves working board members? You're talking about monitoring tens of millions of dollars by senior public servants. And I will say, Mr. Speaker, I have a problem, Mr. Speaker, with this board and the constitution of it being heavily public servants. And I'll come to that later on, Mr. Speaker, because I believe it will compromise a lot of public servants. And I'm not saying board should not have public servants, but this board is largely senior public servants. And you will see later on, Mr. Speaker, everything they do, it has to be consultation with cabinet and with the approval of cabinet, Mr. Speaker. It's like saying the Central Development Bank, everything the board does, they must go to cabinet for, or minister for approval. There is no independence, Mr. Speaker. But that's the point. It's either you take government money and you put it in a separate independent statutory institution to manage. This is not the creation of a statutory institution. This is not what, this is different. This is different, Mr. Speaker. And I want to know whether that fund will have any staff. Because from reading this, the board members are also the staff. 
because there's no provision in there for them to employ staff. There's no provision, and Mr. Speaker, I've been in this house for about three years, and I've seen legislation that come in, and it's specific about that. The CIP legislation is an easy case about it. The Central Tourism Authority, they came to this house. Can someone explain this, Mr. Speaker? Then, Mr. Speaker, let's go on to part two in the bill. Hear this one, Mr. Speaker. Explain this one to me. Loan. A person may make an application to the board for a loan from the fund for a government-approved capital project. And again, I don't know what's a cap government-approved capital, capital project. But a person may make an application for a loan. So a person makes an application for a loan. The board may, after consultation with cabinet, grant or refuse an application within the subsection one. So the board does not have independence. When somebody applies for a loan, the board has to go and consult with cabinet before it can grant or deny. It has to go and consult with cabinet. Cabinet. And you're talking about senior public servants. The wood maze operated. <laughs> I think in law, they probably have a different interpretation. Huh? You understand, Mr. Speaker? But hear what, he, 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 what the next provision is. In deciding the grant or refusal of an application, the board shall, after consultation with cabinet. So, if the honorable member is right, is may, the next one says, in deciding, the board shall, after consultation with cabinet, take into consideration the credentials of the person and information relating to the government of capital, approved capital project. What do you mean, taking into consideration the credentials of the person? So somebody applies to the fund for a loan. The fund has to go and consult with cabinet. And then cabinet may agree to that person getting the loan, and cabinet will consider the credentials of the person involved. What does that mean, Mr. Speaker? What does that mean? That cabinet must consider the credentials of the person involved. Why does cabinet have to decide whether somebody gets a loan from the fund or not? Yes. Mr. Speaker, if I, the board, has to decide whether somebody gets a loan and I have to take their credentials into consideration, but I must go and consult cabinet, are you saying to me I am not consulting cabinet on the credentials of the person? No? Are you saying that to me? That's what this says, you know. It says that, that the board shall, in consultation, considering the credentials of the person involved. This is highly dangerous, Mr. Speaker. Highly dangerous. Highly dangerous. Mr. Speaker, let's go on to investment, Mr. Speaker. 13-1. Now, apparently only two members on the other side can understand this bill. Huh? And a member from Cassius office and a member from Ancillary Canaries. So explain this one to me, Mr. Speaker. A person may make an application to the board for investment by government through the fund in a government-approved capital project. 13.1. Explain that one to me. A person may make an application to the board for investment by government. The person is making an, in, an application to the board for investment by government through the fund in a government-approved capital project. Somebody explain that one to me. Maybe legally it's beautifully crafted, but as a layman, as a legislator reading this, I cannot comprehend this. What is meant by an application to the board for investment by government? Who is making the investment? What is meant by an investment by government? Through the fund for government approved capital project. Already we don't know what's a capital project. So what, what is meant by investment in that case? And what's an investment by government through the fund? Somebody explain that one to me, Mr. Speaker. Maybe the, 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 the honorable member say you know how to make money work. Explain that one to me. How do you make money work in this case, honorable member? That's why it's like that. Mr. Speaker, it goes on. That's why it's like that. And it goes on. But let's just look at five, Mr. Speaker. Listen to this. Don't worry, Pajua, don't worry, you'll delete that, and I'll censor, don't worry. You, you, that's still, we'll delete that. 
Sorry, your time coming. Mr. Speaker, the board may, after, and all the other letters that are out there, they're coming out sooner, the board may, after consultation with Cabinet, grant an investment in exchange for a percentage of shares or other comparable benefit. Explain that one to me, Mr. Speaker. So what is a government approved capital project? Is it a school? Now is somebody applying to the fund for, Mr. Speaker, explain it to me. What is the concept of percent, percentage of shares in exchange for the money they get from the fund? This is the government fund. You are, if I assume, like the Honorable Member from Ancillary Canary said, a government approved capital project is a capital project of government. So we're building a road. So a person applies, a, the person applies to the fund um, for investment by government through the fund. Explain how that works for me. How do you get shares in, in, in exchange for the fund? Explain that one to me. I can understand the loan. I may not agree with it. But explain to me the, the concept of investment. So we want to build a school, and the school is a government-approved capital project. Somebody applies to the fund for what? I can understand he's applying for a loan. But how does he apply for an investment? So explain it to me, Mr. Speaker. I cannot see how this, how this happens, Mr. Speaker. I don't. And that's why I'm suggesting, Mr. Speaker, a bill like that has to be circulated. The public has to read it. The accountants, the lawyers have to read this and give an offer advice to the government as to whether this even makes sense. You may not accept the opposition views. And Mr. Speaker, we've come to this house. We just went for two bills. I recall standing up in this house and saying to the Honorable House, we should not rush how we address the issue of the blacklist of the EU. We should take our time. We should consult. We should set up a parliamentary joint committee to look at it. We've been to this house about three times amending the same act, Mr. Speaker. About three times. Every time we amend it, we're still backlisted, Mr. Speaker. And if we had just taken our time and addressed it properly, we would not have done that. This bill should not have come to this house, Mr. Speaker. The public requires time to study this, to even understand it, Mr. Speaker. I do not understand the section on investment, Mr. Speaker. Maybe somebody in government has a brilliant idea how to make the people's money work. But from a simple re reading of this, Mr. Speaker, and I accept, I'm very simple in my reading. I'm very simple in my reading. But that cannot make sense to me. Maybe there was a concept that was not sufficiently conveyed or how it is drafted. But that cannot make sense to me, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the board, and you look at section 15, the board has to do exactly what the Prime Minister said is not sufficient. The board has to submit a report, has to submit estimates, Mr. Speaker, except this time it's not been done to Parliament for approval. It's been done to the Minister for approval. The Minister and not Parliament, Mr. Speaker. And the audit, Mr. Speaker, an independent auditor. Why can't the, you know, the, the, the Auditor General Director of Audit, Mr. Speaker, why can't the Director of Audit audit the fund? It is a government fund. It's a government fund. This is not a statutory corporation. It's not a government-owned company. And I even, I, I don't know, I mean, the, the, the legal experts will say whether that's even constitutional. Because this is a fund, a government-established fund. Why is an independent auditor auditing it? Why not the Director of Audit? I can understand you set up a statutory corporation. I can understand you set up a government-owned company like SSI and SLASPA and Central Tourism Authority. But this is a fund. I guess there's nothing in that that suggests to me that it has any statutory status or anything of that nature, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I think this whole bill is a reflection of what has happened to the CIP, Mr. Speaker. The CIP has been bastardized and vulgarized by this administration, Mr. Speaker. It has been. The changes, the question about the management of it, well, not so much the management, but the policy direction of it has created uncertainty, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, you look at, for example, range, Mr. Speaker. To this date, 
There's never been a statement to this country as to exactly how much money we paid out of our CIP funds to, to range. In all the account the Prime Minister gave, he never mentioned how much money was paid to range. The member from Ancillary Canary said about 33 million. Somebody else said about 20 odd million, Mr. Speaker. But we've never really been told. That is the people's money, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, when you go on the CIP website, there's one project that pops up as a CIP project, the Galaxy project, Galaxy. And a couple members around the table will remember Galaxy. They just came from attending the event, Mr. Speaker. Galaxy cannot finish their project in St. Kitts, Mr. Speaker. They're still in phase one. Phase one cannot finish. But somebody somehow in St. Lucia did due diligence on Galaxy, did an assessment of the project submitted by Galaxy, and awarded them CIP status, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, you know, there are certain things once you see them, you just smell a rat. A company that cannot finish phase one in St. Kitts, cannot finish phase one in St. Kitts, says they're going to build three hotels in St. Lucia, and they immediately granted CIP status. I will not say much more, Mr. Speaker. At the right time, a lot more will be said, Mr. Speaker. Who it is that assess Galaxy, who it is in the expert opinion believe that Galaxy is a viable project for St. Lucia, and who it is that did due diligence on that Galaxy and passed it, Mr. Speaker. These are questions that will be answered one day. And Galaxy has this huge event in China, Mr. Speaker. And ministers, and of course, I mean, you have to go and, and sell and support, but you're selling and supporting something that's questionable, Mr. Speaker. Questionable. But this is what has happened to the CIP in St. Lucia. So when one sees a bill like this come to Parliament, it really asks you, where are we heading? Where are we heading, Mr. Speaker? And persons will tell you, don't question, don't ask, just accept we will get a hotel or just accept we will get a road. It cannot be that way, Mr. Speaker. It cannot be. Not when you see Dominica is building settlements with CIP money. Dominica building houses all over from CIP money. Hospital has been built from CIP money. Roads been built from CIP money. That's what you see in being done in St. Kitts, in Dominica, in St. Lucia, we want to take our CIP money and put it in a national economic fund that will give loans for people, for persons, in government-approved capital projects with no understanding of what those government capital projects are. I'm trying to visualize it, Mr. Speaker. I'm trying to visualize it. Government tomorrow announces that a health center in Denry North, as the Honorable Member from Denry North is walking in, a new health center for him in Denry North. Is it that somebody can now go to the fund and apply for a loan to go and build that health center for government? Is that what it is? Explain, I, I need to understand the concept of investment. How does it work? What is a government-approved capital project, Mr. Speaker? It's a little fuzzy, Mr. Speaker. And if it's fuzzy, you have to ask questions, Mr. Speaker. You know, I would have much preferred the Prime Minister's suggestion of having a sovereign fund and putting all the money in the sovereign fund. Although I believe, and the Central Labour Party government will use CIP money for direct benefits of the people. That I know. That's what I would support. But this, Mr. Speaker, raises a lot of questions. And we should have asked that this bill be put to the public for reading and consideration. We should not, Mr. Speaker, today, Mr. Speaker, go through all the stages of that bill. Because the Labour Party will respond strongly to this bill. It will not help the cause, Mr. Speaker, because it is wrong. It will not help the cause. We need to reflect on it. We need to correct this, Mr. Speaker. And I ask members on the other side to hold back this bill. 
to allow for some public consultation and to make the necessary corrections where they must be made. Because this is a backward step for accountability and transparency in St. Lucia. And I want to put it to you, Mr. Speaker, that you advise the members on the other side to withhold this bill. Thank you very much.